our message today, we have another opportunity to have a dialogue with um, somebody of the religion in which we are uh, discussing as part of our Many Paths to the One series. Actually, this is, believe it or not, part nine of ten, so we've been on this journey for a long time. Joel, if you'll join me. Yes. So Joel and I have gotten to know each other a little bit by email and phone, but um, really nice to meet you in person today. And we are so grateful not only for the beautiful music you're sharing with us today, but also in sharing with us in the message and telling us a little bit about your journey um, as somebody, Joel has, as Carl mentioned earlier, he's been really um, involved in the Bay Area in music for a long time, but he's also been a, uh, you've also been a Jewish leader in many ways with camps and and many of the synagogues in the area. So um, Lisa and Tyler noticed that as they were speaking to him and planning music. They said, this guy's really knowledgeable. You might talk to him about the message. So that's how this happened, by the uh -huh. way. I don't know if you knew all that. No, <laughs> so, so anyway, we are very honored to have you, all that to say that. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to hear, because I, I heard when we were speaking such a passion um, for your religious path and your spiritual practices. And so I'm curious, what's, what's the heart of that for you? What's the heart of Judaism for you? And, and what, what is it that really hooks you um, and, and allows you to stay the course? It's a lot, it's a lot packed into one. Yeah, it? so many things. <laughs> we'll just go for um, the big one right away. <laughs> I think some of it runs in my blood. Um, half of my family came to this country as missionaries, not as Jewish missionaries as Lutheran missionaries, um, and uh, just seems to run in my blood as much as I have tried to run away from it at times. Uh, it keeps pursuing me, and uh, you know, the Jewish path is, is home. I uh, first put on a guitar and played music in a Jewish service, I think, at the morning of my bar mitzvah. I think we're going to talk about that later. And even though there was a time when I was really rather frustrated with... Um, with the messages of you know the ancient texts, um, with all their problematic aspects, frankly, um, it was still home, and I came home, and it's home and family with all of the wonder and the joy, as well as the tsuris. I'm going to probably pepper my <laughs> talk with a few Yiddish words. Tsuris is troubles, um, for lack of a better translation. Uh, you know that comes with that rocks and the farm. Um, the heart of Judaism, I think, to me, is a combination of bringing holiness and justice to the world. The prophets were really clear that you cannot have holiness without justice. But the part that brings the holiness, in addition to living out the ethical teachings of the Torah and the prophets, the other piece of it is the, 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 the practices that are uniquely Jewish. Uh, practicing the Sabbath, refraining from work, uh, prayer and study, mindful eating, um, which is keeping kosher or some um, form of that, uh, practice of the holidays, and so on. Those are the things which um, help mend the world according to uh, Jewish tradition. Mm, beautiful. So those are some of the ways that you are an observant Jew, in other words, by following some of those practices. And we'll go a little bit deeper into the practices, as much as we can, in our time together. Um, but I am curious, too, just from, from more of an external standpoint, mm -hmm. like the hat that you're wearing, some of the uh, other clothing and um, accoutrements, if you will, <laughs> that come with uh, the tradition. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, Judaism is very physical. And I think it's something which is lost, I think, or not well understood. I think we get um, often pigeonholed as being a very intellectual tradition, which is also true. Do a lot of studying, a lot of arguing. The, the Talmud, this, this great compendium of hundreds of years of Jewish law and practice, contains both majority and minority opinions, and people argue back and forth at the same table and over generations. So the intellectual stuff is there, but the physical practice is really what touches me so much. We do wear distinctive clothing primarily to bring to ourselves an awareness of God's presence covering our heads is one way to do that. 
the, the kippah or the yarmulke in Yiddish is, is a customary way of doing that, but depending on uh, where one falls within the Jewish spectrum, you see all different kinds of hats and head coverings. <coughs> Sometimes it will uh, denote which particular subsect there are some, you know, there are some very, very hardline traditional sects also, and the headgear will even uh, sort of be a display Tip of. You uh, off as to which one it is. Yeah, yeah. it's our, our colors, you know. Um, <laughs> right. We. Um, some Jews, there's a, there's a commandment in the book of Numbers, put fringes on the corners of your garments so that you may look at them and always be reminded of the mitzvot. I should probably explain the word mitzvot a little bit. Um, charges, commandments, precepts, um, duties, they all, it's in the, so many Hebrew words are very hard to translate. Commandments is probably the most common. I think of them more as precepts and, and as charges. So we have ways of reminding ourselves of that. Uh, this is what I'm unfolding here. It's called a talit, a prayer shawl. And I don't know if, do if the you? camera is able to zoom in on one of these things. This is called a tzitzit. The plural is tzitziot. It's a, the Jewish catalog of the 1970s called this ritual macrame. Um, these, <laughs> these knots are wound in a specific way, a numerological way to remind us of the total number of, the total catalog of the precepts, which comes in traditional Judaism to 613. We don't have 10 wow. commandments, we have 613. Not all of them apply in all places. A lot of them apply only in the Holy Land, and some apply only inside the Jerusalem temple. So there are, but there are many, many, you know, it's, our, we, we regulate our behavior, our daily doings as, as part of the practice and people who are familiar, for example, perhaps with, with a Buddhist path or a yogic path can, I think, recognize that we are, we are, we're bound to act as much as we can to keep us mindful of God and of our place in the world. Some people will actually wear, it's only on four-cornered garments um, that these things show up, um, and some people will actually wear, I don't do this, a four-cornered undergarment that has these fringes on them. Other people just put this on when they, when they are praying in the morning. Um, so that is one item. Um, I have here... And, and Joel, yeah. would you, I mean, do you hold those like you would, say, a mala or a rosary, or is it just to have them on you so that you're... In, Both. In remembrance. The okay. time when we hold them is during the recitation of the Shema. The Shema is the called the watchword of the Jewish faith. It's Deuteronomy chapter six. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Yudhe Vavhe, this unpronounceable name that we don't pronounce. Our God, Adonai, Yudhe Vavhe, is one. So it's customary when saying that in the morning when you're wearing the, sh the shawl to gather them in your hand, hold them. I hold them close to my heart. And then there's, that's three paragraphs of text. The third paragraph, which is, which is the paragraph that actually says, put those fringes on, one looks at them, holds them in both hands and looks at them. Other times, then you kind of hang on to it for a while and gradually release them. Interesting. Um, what else do you have there for what us? Else in have I, what else have I, my, <laughs> so in my blue bag, these are called tefillin. Uh, again, in ancient times, people, some people wore these all day. Uh, but one is supposed to be in a in a state of holiness of mind as well and being in order to wear them. And there was a realization that most of us aren't in that place all day and can't be in that place all day. Not only that, it kind of makes you makes it hard for you to do a lot of work. Um, this is I'm not going to unwrap it all the way, but you see there's a there's a box and there's leather straps. Inside the box are pieces of parchment that contain scriptural verses, the Shema that I just mentioned. Uh, and the words that follow, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Uh, and that goes on for a few more sentences. And three or four other sections out of the Torah are encased in these, and we wear them. Um, this one actually goes on my non-dominant hand, and then I wind the straps around my, my arm in a particular ritual way, and I make... The three, one, the three letters of one of the names of God. Sorry. That's okay. If I, if I can help you. Here, I will hand this off to you. Okay. And then the other one, again, that same paragraph that, that begins with Hero Israel says, bind them as a sign on your hand. Right? So we concretize that. It's both abstract and concrete. Right? We, we do these things that are physical, so you can really you can feel it in your body. And let them be a symbol or totafot. Nobody knows what that word means. Frontlets something between your eyes. And this is, uh, I would have a headband on uh, if I were really wearing these and 
two straps dangling down. It's only typically... I'm just going to try it, see how it would feel. Yeah, it's typically worn in morning prayer. You know where your third eye is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's typically worn only in morning prayer. Um, and, you know, you walk around for a while with these little, you know, indentations in your arm, and it feels weird at first, but once I started doing it regularly, it feels, it feels really good. Mm -hmm. It just it has... This, that. It's, Having that physical reminder, it's like ritual, right? We love to do ritual because yeah. it reminds us um, of the spiritual practices that, and, and the, the, it allows us to bring the invisible visible. Right, and there's a ton of that. There's rich, you know, we, we build a ritual building in the fall at Sukkot, which is my favorite holiday. Um, we say, there's a, there's, a, there's a practice of saying 100 blessings every day. I haven't gotten to that stage yet, but uh, there's even a blessing for using the bathroom. Wow. Uh, we, we thank God for the healthy functioning of our bodies. We do this, by the way, after we leave the bathroom. The bathroom is not a place where one says prayers, but after, upon leaving, you thank God for the proper functioning of your body. These this days, is, while washing your hands. <laughs> yeah, right? There's a, there's a, there's a blessing we're, for that, we're too. We're singing <laughs> songs of blessing, aren't we, Lisa? Yeah. God is my source, you know, for those of you who haven't heard yet. Before anything goes in my mouth, um, mm -hmm. I, if, I'm, if I'm on the path, I will say some, some short blessing of gratitude. When I'm done eating or drinking whatever it is, there's another blessing. So if, if you're really on the path, there's this constant reminder of the presence of God in the world and of our duty to bring God more fully into the world through both holiness and, as I said, and, and justice. You know, caring for the stranger, caring for the poor. The Torah says probably 36 times is the number I've heard, do not oppress the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. we, we mark every holiday um, with wine or grape juice as well as a festive meal. Shabbat, we begin by lighting candles. And we end by lighting a candle. I brought this because I thought of it as I was doing this last night at the end of Shabbat. We light another flame, this twisted braided candle. It's a very short, sweet service called Havdalah. Uh, we light a flame because over Shabbat, traditionally, one does not interact with flame. If you start a fire before Shabbat, it can stay on, but it has to be untouched. Um, there's a ton of rules. We can talk about the rules some more because I think they're kind of important. But when you end Shabbat, you physically light a fire, which you have not done for 24 hours. It's, typically, it's more than one flame, and it's typically a braided candle like this. Mm -hmm. And we also smell spices because there is a, a tradition that on Shabbat, you receive an extra soul to enjoy Shabbat on. And even as the rigorous as the practice is in terms of abstention from all kinds of different activities, it is to be observed not as a burden, right, but as a joy, or maybe a little bit of both. You said you receive an extra soul? That's the, that's the tradition, yes. Tell, tell us, what, what does that mean? Do we know what I that means? I wish I knew. I know, the soul. That's <laughs> yeah, always a question, right? isn't it? Um, it's a, it's a, d a deep discussion. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> there's, it's, it's based often on, on readings of biblical texts. Um, there's one um, line that actually we read in the Torah yesterday, that God, upon completing the work of creation, Shavat Vayina Fash, ceased and was refreshed, and that... Vayena Fash in Hebrew contains within it one of the Hebrew words for a soul. Mm. So it's almost as if God, God's self was being resold, and we re are also, you know, in that image. It's part of the re renewal process or the rebirthing process, you could, call it you that, could yeah. say, in a way. Mm -hmm. So each, each week to practice Shabbat, is giving you that complete renewal. Yes, and you un if you're do if you you know many people don't practice Shabbat or have different levels. I'm not by any means where I fully want to be in my practice, but it's an unplugging. I don't touch my computer. I don't touch my phone. I don't write. I do allow myself to drive, which in orthodoxy one would not do, um, and it is a time to be hands off with the world. Instead of exercising dominion and control, creating and destroying as God did for six days biblically, we, again, imitating God, don't do any of that. Mm -hmm. The world is, you know, we're kind of hands off. We are there to observe it, be in it, enjoy it, and let it do its own thing. Mm -hmm. 
and then boy, does the world need that right now. Yeah, it is such a beautiful practice. I have Jewish friends who have really brought that out to wider audiences, and people have started practicing this idea of, I'm going to unplug from sun, sunset to sunset, whether it's Friday to Saturday, Saturday as it is traditionally in Judaism, or if it's just something you choose the day that works best for you. But this idea of being unplugged, of being in, in maybe a community, I don't know. What is yours like? Because for some people it might be in quiet time. For, for others it's being with family, maybe having a meal, having a, a service as at sunset. So tell us a little bit more about your practice. Um, it can be all of the above. Um, Jewish prayer practice is primarily communal. You cannot do a full service without 10 adult Jews in the room. You don't need a rabbi or a cantor. Judaism is very democratic that way. You need one person who has enough knowledge of the service to be able to get up and recite the words of the liturgy, and it is a liturgy. There's a set catalog of things that you say, as well as personal creative stuff that comes from within you each time. Um, so traditionally, Jews gather three times a day, every day, it's not really different on Shabbat except things because there's a little bit more time and takes a little bit longer. There's a service right around sunset time going into the nighttime. The major service on the Sabbath is in the morning. The Torah is taken out and read. It's a longer, more relaxed service than during the week. And then there's a service in the mid to late afternoon. Uh, as I say, it's, it's communal, but especially, you know, I've been getting all these emails because of the situation we're in health-wise. Uh, giving pointers for people on how to pray at home. There are a few things that one does not say if you're not in that community of 10. You skip those parts, but everything else you can do at home. And for me, it's a mix. I like being at home sometimes, staying out of my car if I don't have to be any place. I do do a fair amount of service leading, and that involves travel to most of the synagogues. Um, I go to my own synagogue is close to an hour's walk away. If I'm feeling up to it, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll drive. And uh, some days it's communal for me, and some days it's, it's a more, you know, solo practice. Well, it was interesting because Joel and I were emailing a little bit on Friday, and I said, oh, I'll send you some questions later. You know, we're doing something with the labyrinth, if that's okay. And he said, yeah, that's fine, but Shabbat starts at sunset. And so I was racing to get this stuff to you by sunset. And then afterwards, um, last night, last yesterday evening, he sent me all these new thoughts. I thought, this is how I feel after I've been on retreat, is that I have this complete renewal and just this rush of new thoughts and ideas. And I don't know, is that common for you? That that's kind of, you, you get your, you draw this new inspiration, this renewal, this new soul, if you will, or be, being resold in a way. Um, is, does that happen for you each it week does. typically? More on some weeks than others. Obviously, yes, this right, is on my right, mind, always, very yeah. much on my mind. And yeah. the, the main thought, because part of the practice is not writing, no permanent recording of information. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I hope I remember this. <laughs> but when, when the sun goes down, I hope I'll still remember it and be able to write well, it down. Well, for those of us who tend to be more intellectual, that's really wonderful, right? To not have the written word, not be focused on the yeah. written word so much. We do have the written word because we read a lot. You do read a lot. We okay. read, but, but mm -hmm. the, it's, the, it's the writing down of the information. Maybe if there's time, and I'm, I'm counting on you to keep us on time here. Oh, great. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you I'll got, count on Annie. How many hours do you have? <laughs> no, we're good. Um, the, where do we get the rules for Shabbat? Where do those come from? What are there, there are specific activities that are forbidden on Shabbat. Where do they come from? Um, there are 39 categories of work, and according to the rabbis, these were the 39 categories of, of task or work that were involved in the building of the tabernacle, this portable sanctuary in the desert. The portable sanctuary was to be a microcosm of the universe. Right, holy within holy within holy and the holiest in, furthest inside. And it was also the conduit, the connection between heaven and earth. It was, according to the Torah, the holiest work that the Israelites in the desert could do. They each, everybody brought gifts. We actually have been reading about that as well and we're going to continue doing that. People brought gifts until Moses said, stop, 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 you brought too much. And it was this tremendous holy work, but every single time there's instructions on what to do and how to fit this together with that and what color to make it and where to put the bells and the pomegranates and the golden chains and this sumptuous stuff, there's always admonition, observe Shabbat. Don't do any work on Shabbat. So the connection was made between the creation of the tabernacle and not doing that work on Shabbat. There are 
language connections between, the, between reading about, when we read about how the tabernacle was finished, the language is very similar in the Hebrew to the world being finished. So again, it's this human activity is a microcosm of divine activity. So we stop when God stops, or we stop when God stopped. And all of those different things, weaving and sewing and writing and erasing and shearing sheep and cooking and lighting fires and putting out fires and tying knots and untying knots and all these things that were involved in the creation of this, of this cosmic conduit are the things which we abstain from on Shabbat. So basically, we're not doing really any creation or destruction, what just I, as God did. I love that saying that you shared with me earlier, be still and get going. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same, isn't it? You know, we get, and, and most of us in our culture, we get going, we get going, we get going, we get going until, oh, you know, wow, I have to rest. I have a cold now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Instead of this, Enforced this Shabbat. <laughs> practice of be still, right? So the yeah. practice of be still being, being woven in naturally as part of the rhythm that God gave us. Right. Um, so it's beautiful that you, you adhere to this practice and it sounds like it's really nourishing for you. And, and I want to encourage all of us to consider a way that we can make our own Shabbat, you know, our own Sabbath day in our own ways, um, and, and try out this practice and, and see how it works for us. Cause it's gotta be good. I know it's good when I do that kind of thing. So, I don't know what I would do without it. But I don't do it every week. Yeah. At so, this point, yeah, yeah I, I don't know what I'd do without it. Yeah. I, I really don't. It's been a part of my life now for... 10, 12 years. Mm. And, uh, and in our world today, I think we need it more than ever. It's just everything's so fast moving. So beautiful practice. Well, you, you mentioned earlier um, the, the idea that's connected to commandment, the mitz, mitzvah? Mitzvah, yeah. And mitzvah, single, mitzvah, plural. And then it becomes, you know, it's also used, a similar word is used for bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, mm -hmm. which you mentioned you went through when you were yes. coming of age. Mm -hmm. And I'm always intrigued by that because our culture as a whole doesn't really have a lot of ritual around coming of age, and yet it's so important, that passage between childhood and adulthood. Can you say a little bit about that, um, the bar mitzvah or yeah. the bat mitzvah? It's funny, you know, I... Um, there, I, I've had many students for who, kids who are on their path to bar bat mitzvah, and many of them after their service have their non-Jewish friends coming up and saying, I want to have one too. Um, there are, of course, you know, traditional cultures have these, um, have these coming of age rituals. Um, we, you know, in, in many Christian traditions have confirmations. Uh, there's the quinceanera in uh, Latin American culture many others that I'm not aware of. For, um, for Jews, it, is, it marks the transition to, to Jewish adulthood, obviously not full adulthood, although a thousand years ago, plus, you know, you were pretty close to getting married when you were 13, 14, um, in many cases. So at, at a certain age, it's really just like turning 18. One day, you know, the day before your 18th birthday, you cannot vote. Even if the election is there, you cannot sign a legal document without your parents signing off on it. The day after, you can. You have a whole new set of privileges, rights, as well as obligations to society. That happens to a Jew when they, on the day after their 13th birthday. In some traditions for girls, it's the day after the 12th birthday. When, when you, yourself, become responsible for the performance of all these precepts. The day before that, it was your parents' responsibility. Now, it's on you. And really, the ceremony doesn't do anything to you. You would, I would have, you know, if I'd never gone through a ceremony, I would have still been a bar mitzvah. The literal words are son of the commandments, but what it really means is become subject to the commandments. Bar mitzvah for a boy, bat mitzvah for a girl. You would, the, the commandments are now, or the precepts are now incumbent upon you. The service marks that transition. It is a way of honoring this new adult in the community, um, and they are given a, an honor, which is reserved only for adults, which is to go up and read from the Torah. That gets complicated because typically one has an agent to do one's reading for one. Um, and then, you know, this, the Jewish adult is, has the privilege of leading a service, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. In, Ancient times, when we lived in much closer-knit communities and everybody knew each other and you saw each other in synagogue, 
that was pretty much all that happened. The, 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 the boy, and at that time it would be only a boy, would get their chance to go up and, and have that section of the Torah read. And there might be, you know, a little bit of food and drink afterwards because we always do that. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> we humans. Yes, we humans, we Jews. Nothing, always, you know, there's always going to be food. Um, in modern times, because I think we live a little bit more distantly and because people are less affiliated, we start demanding more. We, we, want it, we want the young people to show a little bit more about their knowledge and their ability to, to function in an adult Jewish community. So in some ways, there's more pressure on them now. I have always tried to tell my students, look, this is what a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah really is. It's what I just explained. You can't screw this up, right? You, this, this is going to happen whether you mess up every single word of what you're supposed to do or whether you do it perfectly. And I also try to tell them messing up is fine. I do it all the time. And everybody out there loves you. Uh, because there really, there can be tremendous anxiety and, and stress around having to do these things in a foreign language. And, well, you know, I used to say in some traditional cultures they might send you out, you know, with a, with a spear and a bag of salt uh, and have you, you know, go hunt down a lion or something like that. We make you sing in front of 200 people while your voice is changing. <laughs> Which can be... I think worse. Yeah, there, <laughs> not that I've ever hunted down a lion myself. Right. <laughs> well, it just it, it's um, it's something that I really appreciate that that there is some kind of ritual. And as many of you know, I'm sort of personally very drawn to the nature and the indigenous rituals. And so some of those kinds of ways of of initiating yourself by going out in nature and having solo time in nature um, is is another way. So there are many different ways. But the fact that it has remained a tradition to me feels like a real gift to our young people and to our society that we honor this important passage from childhood to adulthood for the reasons that you mentioned. So thanks for spending a little time on that topic. Of course. There's one other one, well, there's probably many others, but there's one, uh, there's something that you had mentioned to me that I th found very intriguing that I didn't know about, and this idea of building, or sukkah, I think you called it? Okay, yes. Can, will you talk a little bit about that and how it's related to mindful eating? Because I think you mentioned there's also some aspect of it about the, the huts and the eating. Um, so the mindful eating, I would, I would classify as keeping kosher or some version of it, okay. which again, again involves a lot of, there's a lot of, <clears throat> discussion in the Torah about what critters you can eat and what critters you can't. And then there is the precept, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk, which has been extended to the point where Jews do not have dairy products and meat products at the same meal, which meat including does not include fish, but it does include poultry. Um, and many Jews, including myself, I, I'm basically pescatarian. So as long as Me I too. avoid <laughs> shellfish... Um, and you know, eat only the kosher species of fish that have fins and scales, then I don't need to worry about the whole mixing of dairy thing. Um, and so it's, in some ways, it's, it's a, you know, th my mindful eating is more of a pescatarian, vegetarian practice. The building of the sukkah, you do eat in it. So this happens, this would be called in Christian tradition, Feast of Tabernacles. It's in the fall, it coincides with a fall harvest festival and probably arose out of a pagan fall harvest festival, as so many traditions have, ancient Canaanite or something like that. Um, and biblically, one builds these temporary structures. It's called a sukkah, which comes from a word meaning to cover over. S the, my favorite Hebrew word, by the way, is schach. Wow. Yeah. And that's the, <laughs> it has to be br tree branches, something, something that has been alive, actually not the branches of a living tree, but, you know, palm fronds, very traditional, the roof of this sukkah, which comes from the same root as schach. Um, you should be able to see through it, see through to the stars, and it should be natural, and it should be temporary, and it should give you this feeling of, of temporariness. I mean, if there's any holiday that brings Jews into contact with the Buddhist idea of, t of everything being temporary, it's Sukkot. Uh, it's the most joyous time of the year. It's called the festival. The synagogue interior, if you're in a traditional setting, is gorgeous because, again, there's a commandment. You're supposed to bring in four different plant species, palm fronds, willow branches. Um, what's the other one? Aravot. Um, it's in Hebrew. Willow, uh, myrtle palm, and a funny-looking fruit that looks like a lemon but isn't. It's called an etrog or a citron. And you take them out, and you know, the, all of a sudden, the floor of the synagogue is a holy mess, literally, with 
you know, fronds and leaves everywhere, and people are standing up and they're waving them back and forth like this and like that at different parts and circling around the synagogue, and it's just, it's gorgeous. Mm. At the same time, what do we read as a special scroll at this time of year? Ecclesiastes. Mm. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's all temporary. There's this mixture of, of, of complete joy. The harvest is in. God's been good to us. We're celebrating. We've cleansed ourselves of sin on Yom Kippur just four days prior. In the old days, they would have cleaned out the temple. And really, Yom Kippur was just the house cleaning before the big party, which is what Sukkot was. Uh, we, and then we live in these huts, and we're reminded of how vulnerable we are mm. and how temporary everything is. And then the huts are individual huts outdoors? Outdoors, that, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. I don't have a place in my home where I can build one, so I help others build them, and then I go hang out in them for the week. Beautiful. Well, it's a, it's, and it's a whole week. It's a full week, yep. Okay. And you'd be in community, but you'd still have... Are you all in community in the huts, or are they individual huts? Yeah, both. Both. You can be okay. by yourself. You can have two people in there. You can yeah. have 20 or 30. It's kind of like a hermitage, but communal style. Yes. <laughs> really communal hermitage. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Well, I hadn't even heard about that before, so I don't know if some of you have or haven't, but... Um, it's back to the physicality, right? So, you know, we've got the straps, we've got the boxes, we've got the fringes, yeah. we've got the palm fronds and the and the fruits and the and the nature and the huts, and, you know, it's it's very... Earth-centered and Earth-based. Yeah, I was actually having a, a chat with somebody. We have an annual crab feed recently about ritual, and he was telling me, you know, originally I thought ritual was just such an empty thing, and then uh, something big happened in my life. I think his mother had passed away, and he came back into the ritual of of his religious practice, and it, it became alive for him again. You know, so when we talk about it, and you just hear it in a flat way, oh, you do this, and you put this box on, and you you think, oh, well, why would you do all that? But when when I hear you speak of it with the passion that you're speaking of, and and the meaning behind it, it comes alive, and I get it. It's fun. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's really bringing fun. the joy into our spiritual it, practice, right? Kids love ritual, and they're smart, yeah. right? Kids are smart about this. We, they want that familiarity, that comfort. We're, I mentioned we're a liturgical tradition. We say pretty much the same words every day with some variation if, it, if, if it's Shabbat or a holiday. But that becomes a meditation, you know, it's an extended meditation. You can, you can really go deep by just, you know, you, you get familiar enough with the words, you can close your eyes. And um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a source of really great comfort. Mm -hmm. It's also including the physical in our spiritual experience. So in our traditions of Judaism and, and well, the Abrahamic traditions, let's say, it's very physical, you know, in a way, um, that, that we are not about just transcending the body. No but very much being, and especially Judaism, I think, very much being in the world, in the body, and experiencing our spirituality in, in that embodied form, not separating the two. There are, there are many pleasures that are forbidden in Judaism. Um, you know, pork chops being perhaps one example, or clams. <laughs> but there's a saying uh, that you will be held to account in the world to come in the hereafter, for any permitted pleasure that you did not take part of, oh. that you did, part, did not partake wow. of. I love it. I'm going to need to learn more about Judaism. Okay. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, I, there were a couple other things that you said that um, I just want to make sure that we touch on. So let me tell Oh, one of it, we, we have talked a little bit about joy. And, oh, yeah. um, and so let's just touch on that one, one more time, because this seems like such an important part of Judaism, that things are done in, uh, through the, the power of joy and, and because of joy and bringing forth the joy. And I think that's important because we know that um, the Jewish people have had so much sadness in, in the history um, of the culture and of the people. So tell us a little bit about the importance of joy. So I learned a lot about this from Rabbi Shalom Bachner. He's rabbi in, uh, at a congregation in Modesto and uh, still a member of my congregation, Nativo Shalom in Berkeley as well. Um, there is this stereotype, and it's not inaccurate about, you know, Jews, oi, 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 right? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the joke about the server who comes up to a Jewish couple in a restaurant and says, is anything all right? Um, <laughs> Uh, 
And there is sadness, the sadness that comes from history. There is a day in the middle of summer, the ninth day of Av, when we go deep, deep, deep into the sadness, which is also important, right? We fast, we sit on the floor, we don't wash. Uh, we really get into the grief of the calamities and the destructions that, uh, that have befallen us over history. And there are certain things, Orthodox Jews do not use musical instruments in synagogue. Why? Because they were used in the, in the ancient temple, and the ancient temple is gone. So we do not, you know, we do not try to be that, and we are always in a semi-mourning in that way, in a traditional sense. At the same time, the performance of the mitzvot, again, it can appear burdensome. Um, and sometimes it, it is burdensome, but the idea is, the practice is, to bring joy to that. And I'm, I'm lucky to be in many communities where we acknowledge and revel in the fun of it. I just, like, I keep coming back to Sukkot. It's my favorite morning of the year is the first morning of Sukkot, when you might have slept in that sukkah and not slept very well, but you watch the moon cross over the sky through the semi-transparent roof of the sukkah, and then you bring all your your plant stuff into the synagogue and march around. Uh, what was I talking about? Joy, right. Um, <laughs> you, you know, bringing, mixing the sadness with the joy. Um, seven weeks after that, very, very down. First of all, I, most only six days after is the 15th day of Av, when people used to go out in the fields and meet their mates, meet their potential uh, partners, wives, husbands, etc. Um, and then you, you're on this now seven-week path to the Jewish New Year. Mm. Um, there's again a line in Torah that says, you know, it's actually, there's a couple spots in the Torah where God says, if you do all these things, I'll bless you and things will be good. And there's this long part about if you don't, I'm going to whack you with all kinds of plagues and nastiness. And one of those times says, and all because you did not serve Adonai your God with joy. Um, so the last thing I will say about that is that there's a Talmudic, getting back to this compendium of Jewish law, uh, there's a saying when the month of Adar, we're actually in the month of Adar now, the Jewish month of Adar, it's the, it's the holiday, it's the month when the festive holiday of Purim happens, which is one of the times when the, when the theme is, as we often say, they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Um, <laughs> and Purim is very much like that. It's from the, if you read the book of Esther, Right, it's the story of it's Esther and Mordechai summer, and Haman and the king, <laughs> right? And Haman wanted to wanted to get rid of all the Jews, wanted to kill all of them, and by mysterious ways, uh, the word God never appears in that book, but uh, the mysteries of God's working behind the scenes are what we're supposed to get out of that. Mm. When um, when Adar, when that month comes in, it's the Talmud says we increase our joy, marbin besimcha. When the month of Av comes in, Av being the day that it has the month with the ninth day when everybody's depressed and mourning all the destructions, calamities, we decrease our joy. Mm. It does not say we increase our sorrow. Mm. Mm -hmm. It says we decrease our joy. The joy is still there. Mm. Still a little bit less of it, mm. but still there, even, even, even down in the depths. Yeah. Yom Kippur is also thought of as being a very solemn day. We're repenting and confessing our sins. That's true, but it's also the day when we are cleansed. Mm. And we are, we are joyful in that day of cleansing and coming out the other side of it and getting ready for the big party in six days. I love that. I, lo I love the, the beauty and the, the balance of, the, of all that you just shared with us. And I hope our, our viewers are really enjoying this too. There's um, one last phrase that, that you shared with me that I think will be a nice place for us to close. And that is this idea of doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly. Um, it's really kind of a, a short phrase that I think summarizes a lot of Judaism. And so we typically end our messages with speaking an affirmation together. So I'm going to invite our online viewers to sh share this with us as our affirmation t together today. Let's this is the that. prophet Micah, by the way. Chapter 6, verse 8, if you want to look it up. Thank you. Thanks for the <laughs> reference. So together, let's say, I do justly love mercy and walk humbly. And so it is. Thank you so much for sharing your message with us, Joel. Thank you. And Thanks, we have everybody. some more music coming up from Joel and Lisa.